Well, good morning. I wanted to briefly remind you of something I said last week, that sometimes here we have two different ways of teaching the Bible. Sometimes we start with like a question or an issue or a concern or a topic, and we look to see what the Bible says about that. And other times we just pick a book of the Bible and say, we're just going to learn this, not because of any particular topic, not because of some sort of question we need answered. We just, the question is, what is this book about? What is it that God was saying? What is the message of whatever particular book of the Bible? What was this prophet or this apostle or whoever it may be? What were they saying? What was God revealing? Um, And so that is what we're going to be doing for the next, um, well, in my office, I've charted it out for 12 weeks, okay? I wrote out a 12-week series on the book of Hosea. Um, the, The Lord will determine, I guess, exactly how that goes down. Maybe it'll be a little shorter, maybe a little longer, but whatever God allows me to do, that's what we're gonna do. But I'm thinking maybe about three months of going through this book, Hosea. It is a... On the smaller side, 14 chapters, it's in your Old Testament. And Hosea is a book of the Bible that is hardly ever preached on. Um, There is probably a good number of people in this room who have never heard a sermon out of the book of Hosea ever. Um, There's probably an even bigger number of people who have never heard like a whole series through the book of Hosea. I feel like hardly anybody does that. I mean, when we first decided that we're going to preach on this... Um, I looked at like some of my favorite preachers to see like what they said about it and zip, okay, nobody, (laughs) like this is just not preached on very often at all. Um, And I think it'll be good for those of you who've been Christians for a while and been coming to church for a while, it might be good for you, especially if you are in the category of someone who, and you maybe wouldn't phrase it this way, but you kind of came to the conclusion one day, you showed up at church and you went, I think I know everything in the Bible. I'm I'm pretty sure like I I know all the stuff now. (laughs) Have you ever done this before? Because I think what happens is, When you become a Christian, the first year or two, everything's new. And you're like, oh, that's God. I never heard that before. Whoa, I didn't know that verse was in the Bible. Whoa, that's a good idea. I'm going to start doing that. Whoa, that's a sin. (laughs) Who knew? I'll stop doing that. And it was just all new, right? And then you got to year three and there was new stuff. But then it was also like, oh, but I have heard that before. And oh, that was a good reminder. I'm glad I heard that again. And then year four or five, you're like, wow, there's more and more reminders. Only a few times am I hearing things I never heard before. And then like six or seven, it's like, well, this is still good. I'm getting a lot of reminders and reminders are important. And by the time you've been attending church for about 10 years, you might get to the, you might go, I, I, think, I think I know all the Christian stuff. Like I must, because whenever I show up, they don't say anything I haven't heard. So I must know all the Christian things. This book might make you change your mind about that. Um, When we're done with Hosea, you might might think to yourself, maybe I do not know all the Christian things because I I haven't heard any of this stuff. So if you have your Bible, uh, turn to the book of Hosea at this time. Um, I'm going to read the first chapter of the book of Hosea, and then I'm also going to, which is not long, it's uh, 11 verses. And then I'm going to read the first verse of chapter 2 because the first verse of chapter 2 really should have been in chapter 1. Um, I mean, that's my opinion, but I mean, it's even the, even the translator's opinion. Like, it's just, that's where the paragraph ends. Like, it, the, the unit is all of chapter one and then the first verse of chapter two. And then on chapter two, verse two is when the new, like, the new unit of thought begins. So I'm just going to read the whole, the whole thing, which is chapter one plus one verse, which is all together. So here we go. Hosea chapter one, starting in verse one. The word of the Lord that came to Hosea, son of Beeri, during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and of Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, king of Israel. When the Lord first spoke to Hosea, he said this to him, Go and marry a promiscuous wife, and have children of promiscuity, for the land is committing blatant acts of promiscuity by abandoning the Lord. So he went and married Gomer, daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. And then the Lord said to him, name him Jezreel, for in a little while I will bring the bloodshed of Jezreel on the house of Jehu and put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. On that day I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. She conceived again and gave birth to a daughter, and the Lord said to him, name her no compassion, for I will no longer have compassion on the house of Israel. I will certainly take them away, but I will have compassion on the house of Judah, and I will deliver them by the Lord their God. I will not deliver them by bow, sword, or war or by horses and cavalry. After Gomer had weaned no compassion, she conceived and gave birth to a son. Then the Lord said, Name him not my people, for you are not my people, and I will not be your God. Yet the number of the Israelites will be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or counted. And in the place where they were told, You are not my people, they will be called sons of the living God. And the Judeans and the Israelites will be gathered together And they will appoint for themselves a single ruler and go up from the land, for the day of Jezreel will be great. Call your brothers my people and your sisters compassion. 
So that's the first unit in the book of Hosea. Maybe you've never heard it before. Um, there's a Bible talking out loud right over there somewhere. Um, okay, so we'll just begin. I, I, I'm going to try to be the only one that reads it if we could make that happen. Um, I'm going to begin with verse 1 of chapter 1 and look at the first few words of it. This is how Hosea begins. The word of the Lord that came to Hosea. So whose word is this? The Lord's, right? This is God's word. And I think that's important for us to acknowledge as we begin here. Hosea begins by saying, this was the word of the Lord that came to Hosea. Hosea took words from the Lord and delivered them to the people. We are learning God's word this morning. As we learn the book of Hosea and over the next hopefully three months, as we learn the book of Hosea, I think it's important for us to like, acknowledge that, that we're not just looking at words that somebody wrote to somebody at some point. This is the word of God, like God's words given to people. And so the word of the Lord came to Hosea, and then the next thing is a listing of kings. And the reason that the kings are listed is to show the time period that this happened during, okay? When did this happen? Well, it ha happened during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, king of Israel. So you can see that there's two different countries being talked about here. One is Judah, one is Israel, and the time period of those four kings in Judah and this one king in Israel is the uh, time period for Hosea. Now, um, if you were here three weeks ago, we finished up our series on Mind Your Own Busyness, and we looked at the book of Haggai. And in that sermon, I hope you remember it. Do you remember when we learned Haggai and I, I gave you a summary of the Old Testament starting from the very first page of the Old Testament all the way up to the time period of Haggai? Do you remember that? Yeah, so we talked about all the stuff that happened there. So we're gonna, I'm gonna, I hope you remember it because we're going to go back and recall that. The Israelites moved to the promised land and they conquer it. And I told you back then, um, the first king of Israel was Saul. The second king of Israel was David. The third king of Israel was Solomon. And then after Solomon, the kingdom divided into two. This is that time period. The kingdom was all of Israel. And then when it broke into two, there was like a national divorce sort of. And as it broke into two, um, one of the countries retained the name Israel, but the other one went by Judah. And you can see that's the time period that this all takes place in. The word of the Lord that came to Hosea, well, it was when there was a Judah and an Israel separate from one another with two separate sets of kings, right? So I think that Hosea, as he is prophesying here, is mostly prophesying for the next 14 chapters to more Israel than Judah. Um, but this is during that period of time when the two kingdoms are separate. And in fact, it's when one of the two kingdoms is about to fall, which we'll see. So verse two, when the Lord first spoke to Hosea, he said this to him, go and marry a promiscuous wife and have children of promiscuity. This is one of the most unusual verses in the entire Bible, right? It's hard to imagine this is even in here. What? Why in the world would God do this? Why would he say this? That, that's crazy. Who would have thought that would be in the Bible? He said, go and marry a promiscuous wife. And so there are all sorts of different opinions, interpretations of what this passage um, means, like what was going on at the time. Um, I was, I was look, like reading and researching into this. I think there was at least five or six or maybe seven different views on this. Um, one of the ones is that this has got to be a parable. There's no way that God would actually have this happened in reality, and so this must be a parable about the prophet and his wife that the people were supposed to imagine. What if this happened? Wouldn't it be awful? Um, and they could picture this. There's some people who would say, no, it's not a parable. It really happened. And they would say that um, the, the, Hosea's wife was unfaithful to him before they were married and then unfaithful to him after they were married. Then some people would say, no, he was, she was just unfaithful to him after they were married, but not before. She wasn't a promiscuous wife at the time that they got married, but she became one. Um, I think some people say she was a temple prostitute, even though the passage does not specify that, but that he, he chose one of the temple prostitutes to marry. Um, I don't know how to get into all that other than to say, if you read through the book of Hosea, particularly the first three chapters, it seems to me that at the very least, Hosea's wife is unfaithful to him after he marries her. At some point after he marries her, she cheats on him and is unfaithful to him. So God has this happen in his life. He is a promiscuous wife with children of promiscuity. Why? It says, the reason why is, for the land is committing blatant acts of promiscuity by abandoning the Lord. Now, the word land here obviously is not meant to be taken literal, right? It's not like the soil was sinning against God, right? It's the people in the land. He's saying, the people in the land of Israel, they're all cheating on me. They're all unfaithful to me, right? They're all betraying me. They've all abandoned the Lord. And so he's saying, Hosea is about to go through what God had been going through. Hosea, the prophet of the nation, was about to experience what God had been experiencing. And so verse 3, it says, So he went and married Gomer, 
daughter of Diblaim. Now, Gomer probably sounds like a man's name to you because of Gomer Pyle or Gomer, whoever you've ever met named Gomer. But apparently back then, it was at least at this time period, was a female name. She's definitely a female. So Gomer um, is the who he marries, and it says she conceived and bore him a son. And I don't want to put like too much thought into this, but I will just point out that a lot of the commentators and scholars that talk about this, they do point out that in this particular verse, it says that she conceived and bore him a son. Who's the him? Hosea. So that this, this kid, because if you remember from the chapter I just read to you, three kids get born over the, over, over the, point of this, over the point, point. Over the course of this chapter, three kids get born. This is the first one that's a, that we're about to read about. And the first one, it is specifically said that she conceived and bore him a son. And so the idea here is, we don't know for sure about all three, but for the first one, this one's probably Hosea's biological child. It may very well be that Gomer was faithful to Hosea at the beginning of their marriage. And so at this point, she's pregnant. It's like, whose, whose kid is it? Well, of course, it's Hosea's. Like, that, that's who I'm married to. Okay, so Hosea is who she bears a son for. Now, here it is, verse 4. And the Lord said to him, Hosea, name him Jezreel, the baby, the baby boy. Name him Jezreel, for in a little while I will bring the bloodshed of Jezreel on the house of Jehu to put, and put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. So the name that he's supposed to give this kid is Jezreel. It's a geographical name. Um, in fact, it's a valley, apparently. Later on in the verse, it talks about that. So Jezreel is this geographical location. But in this case, you can see it's more than just a geographical location. This kid's name is a prophecy. This kid's name is supposed to communicate something to the people of Israel. He says, I want you to know you're going to name him Jezreel because something related to the word Jezreel is about to happen. This is a prophecy of the future. Um, In a little while, like in the future, this is what's going to happen. So when people ask, hey, why is his name Jezreel? Because this is about to happen. I will bring the bloodshed of Jezreel on the house of Jehu. Okay. Now this house of Jehu would be the people who were in charge of Israel at this point. Okay, so the word house here could be translated like dynasty, the dynasty of Jehu, that the the kings that came from Jehu, and the king who, like Jehu's, I don't remember what it was, grandson or great-grandson, but the person, Jeroboam, the one who's ruling Israel at the time that this is all happening, the king that was mentioned up in verse 2 as the king of Israel, he's a part of the dynasty of Jehu. And God is saying, through the name of this little boy, this is the thing I'm revealing to the Israelites, the whole kingdom's going to come crashing down. The house of Jehu, the kings that are in charge, it's all going to be over. I'm going to put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. Okay? The bloodshed of Jezreel is going to come upon them. Now, bloodshed of Jezreel is probably a, a, a historical reference to something that had happened in Jezreel, like a violent thing that had happened. And so he's saying this violence that you associate with Jezreel, it's coming back. It's coming back on the kings and the family of Jehu and all the people who are in charge. It's going to, it's going to destroy Israel. Look at verse 5. On that day, I will break the bow of Israel. A bow is a weapon right? Like bow and arrow. If you break the bow, that's an idea of loss of power. That's a defeat. Like I'm going to make sure that, that Israel is defeated and destroyed in the valley of Jezreel. And so when anybody asks, hey, why is that boy named that? Because that's what's about to happen. And then it goes on. Verse six, she conceived again and gave birth to a daughter. And the Lord said to him, name her no compassion. Now, again, the, uh, the scholars and commentators point this out at they, they point out that in this case, she conceived and gave birth to a daughter. It doesn't say that she bore him a daughter this time like it did the time before. And so the idea is maybe that is a hint that this second child out of the three is not his biological child. Because if you remember, he was to marry a promiscuous wife and have children of promiscuity. So it, does, it doesn't specifically say this child is his. It also does not specifically say this child is not his, okay? So I'm just agnostic on that. I don't know for sure. Maybe it's his kid, maybe it's not, I don't know. But legally, it seems to be his kid because he has the right to name her, right? So she gave birth to a daughter, and the Lord said to him, name her what? No compassion. That's a weird name. Why would you name your daughter no compassion, right? Well, the verse says, because I'm going to have no compassion on the house of Israel, Like what was supposed to happen, I think, is the prophet of Israel is living and living his life and people go, oh, what a cute daughter you have. What's her name? No compassion. Huh. Why is she called that? Because God's through having compassion on us. We have cheated on him and hurt him and sinned against him so much that compassion time is over. And the person's going to go, wow, I'm going to not talk to the prophet anymore because I just, that was awful. Like all I did was ask him about the name of his daughter and like nothing but doom and gloom. Like, no, thank you. And I think that was the message. Why is she called no compassion? Because the time of compassion is done. He's not going to have compassion on us anymore. And then let's skip to verse 8. After Gomer had weaned no compassion, stop breastfeeding her, she conceived and gave birth to a son. And again, it doesn't say um, 
that it was his son. So I don't know if child number three is his or not. Maybe he is, maybe he isn't. But it says, then the Lord said, and so again, legally, the son, this is the son that he's going to raise. Then the Lord said, name him not my people. Now that's interesting. If, he, if he's not his kid, that would sort of make sense, right? If you, if you have a kid and you name the kid, not mine, that's probably a clue. But again, I don't want to speak dogmatically about that. I don't know for sure because when it says why he's supposed to name the kid, not my people, the answer isn't because he's not yours. The answer is because Israel is not my people and I will not be their God. So I don't know if this is Hosea's kid or not, but I know is there, we got a little girl running around whose name is No Compassion, and then we got a little boy running around. His name's not my people. And it's the same thing. It's another name that's given, and it's another prophecy that is given to the people. So the people go, why in the world is the name not my people? Because we're not his people anymore. There has been so much infidelity. There's been so much unfaithfulness here that it's like he's not our God anymore. It must be some other God is our God. He's not our God anymore. We're not his people. And so that's the message here of Hosea, at least verses, the, the first nine verses. We're going to get to verses 10, 11, and chapter 2, verse 1, a little bit later in the sermon. But I want to stop here and focus on what was being said to the people of Israel at this time. In this chapter, particularly in verses 2 through 9, we see that the relationships that Hosea has with his family are the prophecy that's given to Israel. The relationships that he has, particularly the, his marriage, his relationship to his wife, and the names of his children in particular, are the prophecy. Hosea's family is the message from the Lord to the people. Now, the title of this sermon, I titled this sermon, The Relationships Were Part of the Prophecy. And the reason I specify the relationships are part of the prophecy, and just instead of saying the relationships are the prophecy, is because I'm overly precise. And I just really wanted to make sure I didn't say anything wrong. And so I point out it's part of the prophecy. And the reason I say it's part of the prophecy is his family and his relationship with his wife and these kids, this is something, particularly with his wife, this is something that is um, the prophecy for the first three chapters. Like it's a lot about his family and particularly Gomer, these first three chapters. But then after that, Hosea goes on. Chapter 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14. And those 10 chapters are not particularly about Hosea's family. Okay, there were just a lot of words that God gave to Hosea to preach to the people of Israel. So I say the relationships were part of the prophecy because they are a very big deal at the beginning part of the prophecy. And then we have a bunch of words unrelated to the relationships that's coming later on in the book. But for this particular sermon, okay, for, for chapter one in particular, if we focus on verses two through nine, the relationships are the prophecy. His marriage and the way that his wife was treating him and the way he was treating her and what she kept doing over and over again, that's the prophecy. That was supposed to communicate something to Israel about the way they were living. And the names of his children were supposed to communicate something to Israel about what was going to happen because of the unfaithfulness in Israel. And so the point here, the point of my sermon this morning, and maybe the main point of the book of Hosea as a whole, is that sin is betrayal. It's not just rule-breaking. Sin is betrayal. It's not just rule breaking. It's a relational thing. When Israel thought of Gomer, I think they were supposed to see themselves eventually. Like maybe not at first. Maybe at first they just go, wow, that's weird. Look at that. The prophet of God, he's such a stand-up guy. And she's always cheating on him all the time. Unfaithful, unfaithful, unfaithful. And then you know, another, they're all drinking tea or whatever they were doing back then. And someone would be, hey, did you hear? Have you heard from Gomer? No, no one's seen her in a month. Oh, poor Hosea. Isn't that awful? He hasn't even done anything to deserve this. I can't believe that she would be unfaithful to him over and over and over again. And I think at some point they were supposed to look at her and they were supposed to judge her, right? They were supposed to look at her and go, oh, she don't, what do you think of her? You think she's awful? Yeah, me too. I was thinking she's the most awful woman I've ever heard of. Yeah, me too. Most awful. And then at some point they were supposed to go, wait a minute, that's us. We are like her. What she is doing to Hosea, that's what we're doing to God. That's what we've been doing to God all our lives. I think they were supposed to see her and think, she's terrible, and then go, oh no, I'm terrible. And when they felt bad for Hosea, I think they were supposed to feel bad for God. I think that when they thought, well, Hosea doesn't deserve this. This guy's being faithful. He has not done anything that this kind of like, unfaithfulness and betrayal should be happening to him. Man, that stinks. I, I feel bad for him. I think at some point they were supposed to go, oh, and I feel bad for God when I think about how I've treated him. 
over and over and over again. I am doing to God, and, and God's perfect. Hosea's not perfect. God's perfect. And I've been doing to him what Gomer's been doing to Hosea. And so what were they doing when they were supposed to look at this and go, wow, we're the people we think are awful. What were they doing? Well, I will tell you that goes beyond the scope of Hosea chapter one. The text that we picked this morning does not say what they were doing. Okay? However, I will let you know, I read ahead. <laughs> I actually read the whole book of Hosea. And so I'm going to give you a little preview of what's coming up that's not mentioned yet, but is going to come up in the prophecy of Hosea. The people of Israel at this time were worshiping Baal. It's spelled B-A-A-L, sometimes pronounced Baal or Baal. And he's a rival deity to God. I mean, rival, not like he's going to win, but just rival in the sense that there were these other, country, there were these other nations nearby and they worshiped Baal. And so the Israelites got caught up into this idol worship, this false god worship. And it's hard to tell exactly what they were doing because it doesn't seem like they just stopped worshiping Yahweh and began to worship Baal. Like there's times where it talks about them doing these um, sacrifices. And so it could be that they were worshiping Yahweh and Baal at the same time. It could be that they were worshiping Baal, but calling him Yahweh, like under the name, we'll, we'll, we'll worship this golden calf, but we'll call it the name of our God. But somehow something was going on where they were worshiping Baal and they essentially were cheating on God, right? The, and then the, the book also talks about the fact that at this time they were trusting in themselves and other nations to take care of them. Instead of trusting that God was going to look out for them, they, we got to make an alliance with the Assyrians and we got to go talk to the people over in Egypt and see what we can get done over there. They were not listening to God. They were not listening to his prophets. I think there's a couple of different times in here where it talks about they stopped listening to the Lord or when God spoke through his prophets, they were not listening to the prophets. I think there's even one part where they talk about how the prophets seemed like crazy to them. That when the prophets stood up and said, this is what you should do, they were going like, oh, that's crazy. That's not what any of us are doing. <laughs> that they must be wrong about that. That's so far off from how things ought, like that's not what we're doing. And they just didn't listen to the prophets. They were being led astray by money and success. I think this is something we're going to see multiple times throughout the book of Hosea. It looks like at this period of time in Israel's history, or, or maybe just before this period of time, there was a time of great economic prosperity. The harvests were good. There was lots of food, plenty of food. Like people were doing very good financially. And so it was easy for them to just kind of forget about God or assume, well, God, what we're doing must be okay. After all, God's blessing us. Look at all the stuff we have. And they were led astray by their money and by their successes. They were not recognizing God as their provider and as their protector. And they were cursing and lying and murdering and stealing and committing adultery. They were betraying God. They were cheating on him. They were unfaithful. And what I think is important for us to get in the year 2024, okay, we, we might look at their sins and go, okay, well, ours are different. And I bet you they are, okay? There's probably some sins that they were doing back then that we're still doing. And there are probably some, some sins they were doing back then that we're not doing anymore. And there's probably some sins we've come up with that they weren't doing back then. But when we look at what we're doing in, in, in our lives, I think it's important for us to go, okay, what is the principle in the book of Hosea that would apply to us? And here it is. I think this is what we need to hear in 2024. Sin is betrayal in a relationship. It's not simply the breaking of rules on some impersonal list somewhere. I think sometimes we get, I don't know, trained in our thinking that bad things are like something that somebody determines somewhere, maybe God, maybe in the Bible, there's some list of like all the bad stuff. And so there's a list of bad things. And yeah, we shouldn't do the bad things. Um, you know, but nobody's perfect. Everybody does the bad things, whatever they are. I don't even know what all the bad things are, in fact. If some people, I'm sure there's a list of good and bad somewhere in here. Um, Ten Commandments, isn't that a thing? Um, it's funny. There are people that if you said, are the Ten Commandments important? They would go, yes, they are. And if you said, can you name all ten? They'd go, no, I can't, Okay. <laughs> And so there are a lot of times we go, yeah, I'm sure there's some important list somewhere of like the sins, but I mean, whatever it says, um, I'm, I'm sure it's good, but like nobody's perfect. And so there's just this list somewhere and, you know, so we don't, so we, so we don't do some of the stuff on the list. And if we think of sin like that, as if it's just this list of things that someone put somewhere and, you know, and nobody really does it, nobody really pays attention to that stuff anyway. If we think of sin like that, we will not take it seriously. That's going to be a big problem with our relationship with God. I mean, I was thinking about this, like, in our life and in our culture. Like, are there times where right and wrong or something that you're supposed to do or not supposed to do are just 
determined by some sort of impersonal list and everybody ignores it. And, and the first thing that I thought of when I thought about it was the sign that I've seen posted at every single hot tub at every single hotel that I have ever stayed at. I don't know, have you ever looked at the sign that's next to the hot tub? Yeah, it's very interesting. Sometimes, if you don't have anything better to do, and you're just sitting there in the hot tub, you look up. I mean, sometimes it's huge. If you, some of you act like you've never seen this sign. It's like six foot by three foot sometimes. Giant sign. And it has all these rules. We'll say the hot tub rules at the top, okay? In fact, it usually says, it says spa rules at the top, which I don't know anyone that calls it a spa. My kids don't ever go, hey, dad, would you like to go to the spa? But anyway, but that's almost all of them say spa rules, and then there's a list of rules. And almost every single time, one of them says shower before entering. <laughs> okay, nobody does that. I've seen people like sand all over their feet, starfish hanging off, and they just jump in. Okay, it's so the shower before entering. Sometimes they'll say something along the lines of like no alcohol, right? And you'll read that, and then you'll look. There's three guys in there with white claws just drinking. And it'll say not to exceed 104 degrees. Usually it says something like that. I've never seen anyone with a thermometer checking, making sure it doesn't exceed 104 degrees. It usually says something like don't stay in here for more than 15 minutes, Okay, which no, no one's checking their watch. No one's making sure that they're not in there for longer than 15 minutes. Sometimes there's a capacity limit on there. It'll say like no more than eight people, right? And I'll look at it and say no more than eight people. And I'll look, there's 15 people in there at that moment. And then what do you do? You just squeeze in between the two white claw guys because who cares, right? It's just, a, it's just an impersonal list and who knows who wrote it and what does it matter? If we think of sin like that, we're not going to take it seriously, so let's think about some of the lists of sins, okay? Is lying a sin? What do you think? Is lying a sin? Yes. yes. I think most of us would think lying's a sin. Some of us might go, well, sometimes it's a sin. I think sometimes there's a time where it's okay to lie. But when someone lies to you, you almost always think that's a sin, okay? When you get lied to, it's like, okay, well, that was wrong. Mine are fine, but that's not okay. Um, okay, so lying's a sin. Is it, and isn't lying, like, isn't that, isn't there a list somewhere in the Bible that says don't lie? Is that one of the Ten Commandments, don't lie? Yes. I mean, close enough. Don't bear false witness. Okay, so it's in there. It's one of the things we should do. Bible says not lie. So how are you doing with that? I think a lot of people go, oh, well, I lie. So is that a big deal? Well, I don't know if it's a big deal. I mean, yes, it's on the list, but it's on the list that everybody ignores sometimes. I'm not perfect. What about dishonoring your parents? Is dishonoring your parents a sin? I think a lot of people say, well, yeah, dishonoring your parents, that's a sin. Although I bet you there'd be some people that would say it this way. Honoring your parents in general, is a very good and important thing, okay? But there's exceptions to every rule, right? My parents are dishonorable. So like in, like in gen generally speaking, yes, people should honor their parents. That particular rule doesn't apply to me because I have dishonorable parents. But I'm sure that's a good rule for everybody else. And what about um, outbursts of anger? Is there any list in the Bible that lists sins? And one of the sins on the list is outbursts of anger. Yeah, the answer is yes. We actually looked at it last week. All right, so it's, it's on the list. How are you doing with that? I think most of us will go, well, I mean, yeah, I get why. But outbursts of anger is, is what you have to do when people are really irritated, right? <laughs> what about greed? Is greed a sin? Yeah, I think a lot of us would say greed's a sin, especially if someone does something to us that's motivated by greed, right? When someone is stingy toward you, when someone is deceitful toward you, when someone tries to trick you for the purpose of money, when someone steals from you, right, there comes a point where you go, oh, that person loves money more than me. That hurts. Are you ever greedy? Do you ever love money more than people? And so if we think of these things as just impersonal stuff on a list, it's just on a list that everybody ignores sometimes, we will not take sin seriously. <laughs> But the book of Hosea doesn't really let us get away with that. Hosea helps us see that sin is unfaithfulness to someone. Sin is the rejection of someone. Sin is betrayal of a person. And not just any person. The person who made you and loves you better than anyone has ever loved you. That's who we're being unfaithful toward. Have you ever thought about that? He's the one who created you. 
He gave you every sunset that you've ever seen, every drop of rain that has produced every piece of food that you've ever eaten, the air in your lungs, every single breath you take is from him. And if you're here and you're a believer in Jesus Christ, if you're a Christian, you know God sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for your sins. Like he came here for us. He gave his life for yours. God is not an impersonal force. I've said this here a lot of times because I think it's important for us to get. He's not this impersonal force. He's not like the name that we give to the ethical principles that, you know, rule, hold the world together. If we are going to take sin seriously, we need to see it the way God sees it. And the way he sees it is, it is the unfaithful betrayal of a person who has been faithful to you. If you go, well, now I'm starting to feel bad. That, we're, that's what we're supposed to feel when, this, when we get this kind of information. We're supposed to feel bad. Now, if you look at verse 10, 11, and chapter 2, verse 1, you will see that there's a foreshadowing of hope. You will see that there is eventual salvation and grace, even in Hosea chapter 1. So after he declares this, no compassion and not my people, then this comes. This is Hosea 1, verse 10. Yet the number of the Israelites will be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or counted. That is a promise. That is a fulfillment of a promise that was made back to Abraham in the book of Genesis. So he's saying he's going to be faithful to everything he said he would do. And then it says, and in the place where they were told, you are not my people, they will be called sons of the living God. That there are people who were his people. And then there came a point where he said, you're not my people. And the people who are not his people will one day be called sons of the living God. The judgment is going to be reversed. And then the next verse says, And the Judeans and the Israelites will be gathered together. They will appoint for themselves a single ruler and go up from the land, for the day of Jezreel will be great. So you can see when it says Judeans and Israelites, that's the two people of the two countries. And he's saying one day they're going to gather back together. It's not going to be two countries forever. They're going to be gathered back together. They're going to be united. And they will appoint for themselves a single ruler. There will be one person that will be the king of all the Jews. Now, who is this person in the future that will be a single ruler that unites all of the people back together? Yeah, it's the, this is a reference to the Messiah. Almost certainly this is a reference to the Messiah who will come one day. And we now know from the New Testament, this is Jesus. That Jesus is the one who is the king of the Jews. He's the king of all the Jews. In fact, we find out he's the king of everybody. And so he's coming one day. And then it ends with this. Chapter 2, verse 1. Call your brothers my people and your sisters compassion. So why would you call the guys my people, and why would you call the girls compassion? Well, if you remember the kids' names, it was the boy that was named not my people, and it was the girl that was named no compassion. And he's saying there's going to come a day when you call the guys my people. There's going to come a day where you don't call the girls no compassion, you're going to, you're going to call them compassion. There's going to be a reversal of the judgment. And so what we see here, even in Hosea 1, is that there is a solution to sin, there is salvation and grace, even in the midst of great infidelity. And so I wanted to end with the gospel. I wanted to describe for you the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because if we were to say to ourselves, well, what is it? What is the solution to sin? Well, it's going to be the day that God keeps his promises and the people who are not my people become his people. And there's one single ruler over all the people. And there is people, right? The solution to the problem of sin is the gospel. The solution to sin is Jesus. Always has been. So I want to describe for you the gospel, but I want to describe it to you in like relational terms to match the tone of Hosea. How does God set up salvation for us? I want you to think about this. He sent Jesus. Jesus came here to save us and he sent Jesus and, and Jesus was a person. Have you thought about that? Like Jesus came as a person. God didn't drop down a bunch of money as if like there was a financial debt that needed to be paid. God didn't come up with some sort of memory wipe, like, oh, let's just pretend none of that happened. He sent a person. And our unfaithfulness to him, our unfaithfulness to God, was credited to Jesus. And his faithfulness to God the Father is credited to us, those of us who believe in him. And our response to that is not merely obedience, but trust. 
that a real person would come and take on our sin and give us his righteousness, our response to that is, and the reason I said not mere obedience, but trust, I say not mere obedience because I think it certainly includes obedience. Our response to what Jesus has done certainly must include that we will obey him. But I think it's something more than just obedience. I think trust is more relational than just obedience. You can obey the hot tub sign. Like you could go to the hot tub sign, you can knock the white claws out of the guy's hands and pull out a thermometer and make sure that everybody's following all the rules. But there's something more to it than that, right? It's, it's not just obedience, it's trust. It's, there's, there's this person that died on the cross for my sins. And so I will obey you because I believe in you. And the result is not merely a ticket to heaven, but the restoration of a relationship, The reason I say not merely a ticket to heaven is because, sure, it kind of is a ticket to heaven. Like when Christians say things like, if you believe in Jesus Christ, if you repent of your sins and turn to Jesus, when you die, you will go to heaven and not hell. Like the reason Christians say that is because it's true. But there's more to it than that. Because ticket to heaven, I mean, that does sound, that's a very impersonal way to put it. Like the reason that you're allowed into the heaven is because the relationship that you ruined has been restored. Isn't that good news? So more to come, uh, if God wills, over the next three months. But for now, I think the best takeaway that I can emphasize from Hosea, particularly chapter one, is that God is a person and our abandoning him and our turning back to him, all of that is personal. Let's pray. God, I believe that meditating on this truth this past week has been very good for me. So I pray it would be good for these people who here heard it today. As Doug Davison preached last week, and he talked about sinning, and we keep sinning, and what do we do? Some people even want to know, well, what's the next step? What do I have to know? And I don't know, for me, it was very helpful this week to think about if I want to stop sinning, then I got to stop thinking about sins as like impersonal things on lists somewhere, and I got to start thinking about my relationship with you and how it's a betrayal of, a, of an actual relationship, someone who I've, I should never have betrayed. And I think that's helpful for me to be able to take it seriously. And so I thank you for the book of Hosea. I thank you for this image that you've given to the people of Israel and, and by extension to us now. I thank you for the gospel. I thank you that when these people were in, the, in the, their worst time spiritually to the point that you actually said, no more compassion, you're not my people. That you didn't end it there. But you said, one day they'll be my sons and people will be saying, my people in compassion. One day a single ruler will show up. So we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the gospel. We thank you that he would take on the consequences of our unfaithfulness and that you would forgive us and give us a record of faithfulness that we we did not earn. We thank you for the gospel. We praise you. And I pray that you would help us as a congregation, that we would live in line with your gospel and that we would be faithful to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let me end with these good words from God's word. And in the place where they were told, you are not my people, they will be called sons of the living God. That is good news.